Hello, I'm Nathan Rosenberg. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Big Think Edge. We're really pleased to have you here. I'm the uh, founder of a management consulting firm, uh, Insignium. Uh, we started out, uh, our work is organizational transformation, a discipline we helped found uh, working at a transformation of Ford Motor Company uh, back in the early 80s. Um, I'm a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. I was an officer in the Navy. Uh, I flew, I flew uh, helicopters, search and rescue, and I worked for the Secretary of Defense as his executive support officer. Um, we're going to be de delving into the area of leadership, of management, of discipline with Brent. Um, Brent Gleason is a Navy, former Navy SEAL, a combat veteran with uh, three deployments as an entrepreneur, and he's become a, an award-winning entrepreneur, a best-selling author. We'll talk about both the book that he's already written, Taking Point, and his book that will be coming out uh, in the fall, Embrace the Suck. <laughs> uh, we'll, and, uh, and he's known around the world as an acclaimed speaker and a consultant on topics ranging from leadership uh, to building high-performance team, from corporate culture to organizational transformation, and he and I share those passions. Uh, Brent is the founder and CEO of his management consulting firm, Taking Point Leadership, which is a progressive leadership uh, management consulting firm uh, with a focus on business transformation, building high performance cultures. And uh, besides uh, that, as I said, his uh, current book, the one that you can buy today at Amazon, Taking Point and Navy SEALs 10, fail safe principles for leading through change. So Brent, welcome. We're happy to have you here. And uh, on behalf of everybody at uh, Big Think, thanks thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thanks so much, Nathan. It's, uh, it's good to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Good. Brent, I think I think I'd really like to start out with with kind of a softball, but but one that uh, everybody in the, in the uh, audience would, would think about. Tell us about the transition from being a Navy SEAL, being a warrior, to uh, being an entrepreneur and, 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 a, uh, and a management consultant. How, how does one make that transition? Seems like those are. <laughs> well, e even more interestingly uh, is what happened before I joined the Navy. Actually, I uh, grew up in Dallas, Texas and did my undergraduate education at Southern Methodist University with degrees in finance and economics. And uh, then I took a job as a financial analyst with a global real estate development firm. Um, now, during that time, I had uh, a college buddy of mine, one of my fraternity brothers, who was a year behind me at SMU. Uh, he was so he was now a senior. I was out working in corporate America, doing the finance thing. And he was one of these young men that had a, more or less a lifelong passion and dream to join the Navy and at least attempt to be accepted into the Naval Special Warfare training program uh, for the SEAL teams. And while I thought that was highly admirable, I deemed it to be a somewhat unrealistic career path, uh, understanding the rigors of the, of the job and the extremely high attrition rate, as you know. Um, so I was working, but we started uh, training together. For me, it was just a way to stay fit, uh, help a friend prepare for his arduous journey. And during that time, I started reading more books about the history of the Naval Special Warfare community, uh, all the way from our forefathers and the UDT teams uh, in during World War II to how we really cut our teeth as a premier assault force in Vietnam in the years since then, and became really fascinated with, uh, with the mindset, with the culture of that organization, a culture of high performance, and how they became essentially one of the most elite special operations units in the world. And that growing fascination coupled with the somewhat boring nature of my entry-level financial analyst position uh, led me to the, the culmination of making the decision to 
live a life of no regrets and knowing that uh, pivot tables and spreadsheets will be there for me when I return. So uh, one day I wrote my parents a letter and told them I was <laughs> quitting my job, that they were just thrilled that I had in the first place uh, to join the Navy uh, with my friend and attempt uh, to be accepted into the SEAL program. Uh, by the grace of God, I was accepted and did uh, obviously make it. Was assigned to SEAL Team 5 um, literally three days before our class started advanced training. There's a We can talk about the pipeline later, but it uh, was 9-11. So I joined with a pre-9-11 mindset, and 9-11 happened uh, while I was in the midst yeah. of finalizing my SEAL training and before going to a team. So did several combat tours uh, with Team 5 in you know, a very busy time with a high operational tempo, and had never planned on doing it as a career. And, and you know, we'll, we get deep today if you want, but I, I do have obviously regrets for not staying in longer. We all back then thought there's no possible way these conflicts could go on as long as they have. So for me, I stuck to my plan to transition back out, uh, went to graduate school, and I used a lot of the, uh, the, the mindset, the behaviors, the leadership skill sets that we learn, obviously, as you know, in, uh, in the military to launch into uh, uh, another arena wrought with failure called entrepreneurship. Uh, has about the same failure rate as SEAL training. <laughs> about 85, 90% of startups uh, ultimately fail. Um, but quite truthfully, I, I really had to, it wasn't just, well, you know, you're in, you're in the military, you know how to lead in any environment. It was, uh, actually quite an eye-opening experience learning how to lead today's modern multi-generational workforces and millennials and, um, you know, the soft skills that are uh, necessary for effectively leading in today's, uh, 21st century business environment were not necessarily something that, uh, not a skill set that I had. And that was something that I, I believe, and you know this, that, true leaders are lifelong learners. So that really began my journey uh, in lifelong learning when it comes to leadership, organizational change. Uh, outside of the military, I had no real experience in organizational transformation. I know you're an expert. Well, we can geek out about that subject today for sure. But uh, it, it, it was a challenge early yeah. on. And I've, you know, as long as we as leaders just go all in and learn how to navigate change, we're all navigating more change right now than we have in a long time across all businesses, most industries, and it's been a journey. So I'm sure we'll get into more of that here in a little bit. Great. Brent, you know, um, I think most of the people, we're getting feedback. No, okay. I, I Brent, I think, um, I think most of the folks who are participating today uh, probably have either seen a movie in which uh, Bud's was part of uh, of the movie, or they've seen the, the on the History Channel the the series that was done on Basic Underwater Demolition School. So <clears throat> that that experience, and in particularly in Hell Week, uh, your ability to stick with it, uh, what Angela Duckworth from University of Pennsylvania calls grit, um, is has been shown to be a real determinant of success in life forget about success in the military, success in life. Talk about what were the lessons from Buds? What, I mean, there, what, at the end of that period in San Diego, what did you walk out with before you went, as you said, uh, for, for your next level of training? Question, I really think I've, I've learned more about the fundamentals of grit and resilience, and we'll get into that in a little bit more so in, in retrospect, looking back on those experiences, because once you're on that speeding freight train, it's go, 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 and then war broke out, and you go to a team and you're go, 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 and <laughs> you're deploying and training constantly. Yeah. But one of the things that I've really learned about that, uh, I can tell through the story, is how uh, I now mentor uh, young, uh, young men into and through the SEAL training program. It's not a formal program by any means, but, uh, and I'm also on the executive board of the SEAL Family Foundation, and uh, a discussion came up with one of the, our high-ranking uh, SEAL commanders, and I was curious about the subject over the past 20 years now in this post-9-11 world we live in, have we as an organization in Naval Special Warfare done any significant research, investing time or resources into the mental, cognitive, physical, and emotional attributes of students more likely to make it through the training. Uh, uh, Angela talks a lot about you know, the, the, the research done around grit and resilience in her book. 
And the answer was yes, we have. We actually spent millions of dollars and, and years in data collection and surveys and exit interviews and all kinds of very corporate things. And outside of the less measurable data points around grit, resilience, and passion, I call them the three Ps. These are what I look for in my in my mentees. Uh, and it's hard to measure these before our students have been really tested by the brutal is, you know, passion, persistence, and purpose. Uh, and it really kind of signifies what we've discovered around the students that are successful navigating uh, the horrors of SEAL training is grit, resilience, and a deep, deep passion to serve. Now, obviously, this applies in any walk of life, in any, whether you're attempting to be a successful athlete, a successful philanthropist, business person, entrepreneur, uh, without passion, without perseverance, obviously, academia, other types of experiences have less value if there's an emotional connection to the cause, to the mission, to the vision that's trying to be fulfilled, uh, we often fall short uh, in meeting those goals. So when I look back on it, I realized that uh, I did end up developing a deep passion uh, for service and that level of emotional connection is what drove me through uh, the hardest parts of training. It's a different journey for every single person, uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Uh, but obviously, I've taken a lot of those mental models and, and that mindset into you know my current life as a as an entrepreneur, as a as a husband, as a father, all these things. Resilience is a is a wonderful thing to practice. It's like any you know. I always I was doing the research and saying, well, you know, because resilience has kind of posed a bit of a challenge for psychologists over the years. Do some people have more? sums in their resilience bank accounts and others you know how do we make more deposits than withdrawals um, and really it's like any any muscle uh, resilience and grit can be developed over time if we actively practice it and we can talk about some of the tools and models i put in the book um, as we go through the conversation so yeah well and that's that's really what i wanted to ask about you know in these tough times brent how how would you counsel how would you coach the folks that are on the on the program with us, how would you coach them to develop their grit? How would you coach them to develop their resilience and their passion when you know they're probably sitting at home, working at the kitchen table, um, trying to get their kids educated? Uh, and and I mean, what's the application in these times of grit, resilience, and passion, um, and and in working in the conditions that we all find ourselves today? Sure. Um, you know, one of my fa favorite military quotes that applies to the business and life in general is no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So we all have these grandiose plans this year, our 2020 business plans, plans for our families, the vacations we were going to be on as we speak. Uh, none of that's happening right now. And one of the philosophies that you learn very early on uh, in SEAL training and in combat, uh, and I'll explain where this phrase comes from, is, is we say stay in your three foot world. Uh, that phrase actually comes from uh, one of my friends, uh, Mark Owen, uh, the best-selling author of No Easy Day about the Bin Laden mission, also best-selling author of No Hero. He was a uh, death group uh, for SEAL Team 6 team leader, uh, one of our uh, Tier 1 special mission units. And the story comes from a rock climbing uh, training trip that he was on with his squadron. And he was 100 feet up doing lead climber course. And lead climber means you're the lead climber and you're putting protection in the wall. So if you're 20 feet above your last piece of protection and you fall, you're gonna fall 40 feet before a violent jerk on the road snaps you back up. And <laughs> he froze a bit and the instructor climbed up to where he was and he said, what's going on? And Matt was looking down and he was looking out at the Vegas skyline and, and he said, don't worry about who's down there. Don't worry about what's out there. Stay in your three foot world. Simply put, it means we need to focus on what is in our immediate control right now. There are so many things out of our control, whether it be with our businesses, our families, our finances, that we can only focus on and reprioritize things that are in our control. I would imagine everybody listening or watching right now has had to do a lot of reprioritization over the past few months with our businesses. If anybody out there is running a small business, I know we have as well. Uh, we've shifted um, a large majority of our focuses as a, as a leadership and management consulting firm to other projects <laughs> that have been on the side burner for quite a while. Uh, we're not traveling as much. We've taken all of our clients uh, to to, uh, to virtual training for now, doing a lot of things that we, we can and already do somewhat virtually, but a lot more than we ever have. It's a time for innovation, a time for creativity, but again, a time for 
simply focusing on what we can control and not stressing about what we cannot. I mean, we've, we applied for the Paycheck Protection Program loan uh, and, and did actually receive it. Uh, so that was good. So there has been a lot of ambiguity out there and ambiguity obviously leads to fear. It leads to uh, battle fatigue, <laughs> even in the business, uh, in the business realm. And especially for those out there in a leadership or management position, one of our burdens of command is for us to stay calm. You know, we say calm is contagious. Well, so is panic. So uh, as leaders, as managers, it's our job to bring the team together, communicate with them more now than ever, be it virtual, be it over the phone, whatever is necessary, and have a plan, reprioritize, and refocus the team's energy on what they can control. In, in, in your book, Taking Point, Brent, one of the chapters, uh, one, of the, one of the 10 points is mission. And earlier you talked about purpose. Um, there's more talk about organizations being purpose-led, purpose-driven. But let's talk about uh, having a personal mission, as you talk about in the book. Let's talk about having a, a personal purpose. How, do, how does one go about inventing a purpose for their life? How does one go for their work? Sure. Um, and I, I talk about this actually quite a bit in uh, the new book, uh, Embrace the Suck, as far as how we identify uh, the goals that we're trying to achieve, the, the vision and purpose we have for our lives, you know, working backwards from the end. And I didn't burn out. And it really comes down to understanding what our true core values are. A lot of us say that we know what our values are, or we loosely think about them sometimes or casually talk about them, but not many of us really write them down. We don't really reflect on them as identifying supporting behaviors to ensure that we're living by those values uh, and understanding what our true purpose is. It's not an easy thing to identify. Uh, it takes a lot of deep reflection and often, oftentimes course correction throughout our lives as external factors and different types of experiences continue to shape those values or even have us reconsider what, what we really care about. You know, one of the chapters in the book is about, you know, maybe your values are all wrong. Uh, sometimes even the most well-intentioned people, myself included, are forging ahead on the business battlefield or trying to accomplish this goal or that goal. And sometimes we realize that those goals or the activities associated with achievement aren't necessarily in line with what we really care about or what we really value or we haven't really identified uh, or written down what we care about and what we value. Therefore, we never reflect on it. We don't associate that with uh, the accomplishments we're either trying to achieve or the failures and obstacles that inevitably stand in our way. But I think now more than ever too is, and again, the, the book is unfortunately timely. That was not uh, intentional. <laughs> so it will be coming out in December at the end of the year. Uh, right after the election. So half the country is going to be pissed off. Half the country or the whole country is going to have had a crappy year. Um, so, hey, uh, it is what it is. But again, in all in all honesty, in all sincerity, I hope it's a valuable tool for people because I think we're all reassessing what our real priorities are. I mean, this this current environment has made us rethink uh, our priorities and, and what we care about in all aspects of business, family, faith, love, the activities we engage in, the way we spend our time. And it's important for us to reflect on those things, especially as we all go through not just business transformation right now, but our personal journey in what does the future hold for us next year, two years from now? Will this have impacted us mentally, emotionally, physically? Uh, you know, mental health, uh, you know, in May is um, mental health month. Um, and there's been a lot on the news about that. And also, if we think about what the suicide rate with veterans is, or just in general here in the United States, you know, Imagine how that's being impacted layering in a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's something that's, you know, quite concerning. Yeah. So, Brent, so, good answer on the individual. How about on the, on the organizational level? We've got a company of 10, 20, 30,000 people. How does a company invent a purpose that's inspiring to those people? How does a company... Uh, create values. I remember years ago walking, uh, I, I was going to see the CEO of a large aerospace company, uh, take, took the elevator up to the top floor, walked all the way around to the corner office. As I'm walking around, there's posters on the wall and the word integrity or honesty must have been on those posters three or four or five times. 
Uh, and this was a company that had just been indicted uh, for trying to bribe a defense official. Um, um, so more often these corporate values are, uh, I don't know, the, the value du jour or uh, what they think should be their values rather than what they actually value what they think the purpose should be rather than an authentic purpose. How does a, how does a large organization go about inventing values and purpose or mission? It's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. And the, the word that came to mind is inauthentic. In, in many organizations, the, the core values are part of a very expensive and lengthy brand development exercise. And it's part of their identity and who they want to be, not just internally, but externally to current and potential customers or clients. But all of that is wildly inauthentic unless there's a deep connection to that, not just from the founders or the C-level executives or even the board of directors, but how does that bleed down to the front lines? Uh, how can you use that from everything from brand marketing to talent acquisition to onboarding new employees to training them to your rewards and recognition programs to how you, how you judge what's right and wrong within the organization, the decisions you make, even with new business. Uh, you know, I've been there where, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time in one of my previous companies identifying what those values needed to be. We believed them to be authentic, but then we would make decisions based more on financial return than on what those true values are. And in the best case scenario, if you're not living by what those values are, a team should cease to exist. So the opposite is true. The team should thrive if everyone is connected to those values. Um, one of the things we do uh, with our working with our clients, especially when they've identified what their core values are, is one is to reassess uh, their authenticity. And you can do this with a large cross section of people and large and small organizations. But a lot of people have to be involved in this process, not just people at the top or or uh, a, a consulting firm on the side, but encouraging a good cross section of what I call you know, brand evangelists and change evangelists within the organization that are probably your biggest champions of the organization. They live by the values that you have or have currently identified. People respect them and they should be part of the process of not just identifying the values, but what we develop with our clients is called a team charter. So it takes values and purpose to a much deeper level. So how do we, okay, great. We have our values. They're on the wall. They're on the posters. They're on some of your, your agendas and your meetings. Great. Well, how do we take that to a deeper level? How do we measure that we're living by those values every day? So you have the next layer is supporting behaviors. Let's identify the actual behaviors associated with, let's use that integrity. Well, what does that mean here in this organization? What actual behaviors are we going to identify that we will reward, tolerate, and not tolerate at all? And then the third layer is the accountability mechanisms. So integrity is a core value. We have the supporting behaviors identified. What are the actual accountability mechanisms that are documented that everybody knows. All employees who are onboarded know these. They pretty much agreed through a sort of informal social contract to these before they're even starting their first day in the best case scenario. So be specific with the accountability mechanisms. And you're wrapping this up into a team charter that really identifies, also connects to your purpose of the organization, the why behind the organization exists. And if you don't have both of those elements, you can have a purpose, but without those supporting pieces, it's very, likely that you will not fulfill that purpose and, and the opposite is true as well so very good that's boy that's powerful that, that very practical thank you for that uh brent you, you've clearly sure. engaged uh, our audience we've got a ton of questions so um i'd like to open it up to to uh our participants asking some question so uh, uh lauren can can we tee somebody up and give them an opportunity to ask brent Are they going to be popping up here on the side, Nathan? I think so, but uh, I didn't see anybody pop up. All right. Well, until I figure out what the heck I'm supposed to do, let me ask you one, <laughs> uh, one more question. Let me. Yeah. Um, Brent, I don't know if you would agree with this. Uh, what we say at Insignium is unquestionably the most 
high performance organizational structure that we know of for us human beings as teams. And certainly uh, part of those lessons have been learned from uh, the SEALs uh, in addition to special forces, in addition to sports. Um, what, what can you tell us about high performing teams? What can you tell us about how to get teams of people to share a, um, a task, to share a mission and to be successful in fulfilling that? And in particular, one of the things I'd like you to address, which I think gets lost in business and is always part of uh, a military team is briefing and then debriefing. Sure. Um, you know, there's there's many and I've written uh, several articles on this, and I think one of my Forbes articles was like 15 attributes of high performance teams. I think we can just focus on uh, a few of them. Uh, we've talked about one. One is a uh, uh, purpose, shared values, and a deep emotional connection to the mission. That needs to uh, include everybody on the team. As you know, with the work that you do, uh, engagement in, in an organization or in a team can be quite challenging. Uh, it's easy to associate high levels of engagement and performance to special operations or uh, winning sports teams and, uh, and organizations like that. In your, your general business organization, as we know, engagement is usually relatively low, usually only around 34, 35, 36 percent, with the rest of the team being somewhat actively or passively disengaged. Uh, again, the burden of command of leaders and managers is to make engagement uh, and uh, that mo emotional connection a, a strategic priority as part of their job. Um, the others are that, that, that high-performing teams uh, not just have a shared connection to the mission, there's total buy-in across the organization, there's total accountability and ownership across the organization. That's by having the right people, obviously, on the bus, as we say, and they're in the right seats. They understand how their job function, even the most mundane tasks associated with mission success. I mean, as you know, in the military, not everything you do and every day is sexy and would you put on a movie screen. There's a lot of boring stuff yes. <laughs> that we do. Yes. And in fact, more boring stuff than the, the uh, brief moments of sheer terror and excitement. Um, but that emotional connection drives anybody in an organization, even through those mundane tasks, because they know exactly how that task associates with mission success, mission completion, fulfillment of that, of that vision. Uh, and then of course, they're very good to your point at creating the right types of goals, the right type, using the right type of planning methodology and the right type of debriefing methodology. High performance teams uh, crave constant transparent feedback. They put in place proper feedback loops to ensure that there's rapid course correction and a, a, a learning culture. Uh, I mean, that's another big piece of it. Um, we'll kind of leave it with those those sort of five to six elements of high performance, but the highest performing individuals and the highest performing teams have a learning culture as part of their organization. They're always asking themselves, what have we done well? What have we not done so well? And how are we going to apply those lessons learned to future missions, future projects, future games, future operations, our training, the resources we invest in, pretty much everything. And I know you do this as well, but we teach our clients, you know, how to do proper, not just planning, but proper debriefing. Uh, a lot of organizations, yeah. even they do debrief yeah. projects or even, even wins, not just failures. That's a misconception. But we end with a quick casual conversation. Maybe not even the right people are in the room. And then we go on about our business on to the next big thing. Uh, nothing is documented. No real actionable insights are noted. There's no accountabilities after that. Uh, information is not disseminated, as you know, in the military. Right? One of the things we, you know, our after action reviews are paramount to a lot of what goes into our intel reports that are disseminated across the organization so that people can learn. <laughs> so uh, it's something that, I mean, those are the main attributes of high performing teams that, that uh, I really am passionate about and like to focus on, especially to your point about uh, the learning culture and proper debriefing so that they can constantly yeah. learn, constantly so course correct. Yeah. And they're basically the state of the Japanese word is Kaizen. It means a constant state of improvement. Yeah, and, and I heard just yeah. heard a parallel in what you said about values, authentic values, which is for, in learning organizations and high performing teams, there's actually structures, there's behaviors that enable that learning to go on all the time. Right, exactly. Yeah. Very good. Brent, I, I, we just got a question from what I assume a young man or a young woman, which I'm I'm really pleased to, to share and ask you. 
So uh, this, this young person writes, hello, Brent, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL when I'm older, but I want to find a mentor to train the, me mentally. How do I find one? <laughs> well, uh, well, there's there's actually uh, there's actually a lot of resources now more than ever for like formal channels through uh, you know, SealSwick.com and, and a lot of actual formal channels. Navy and the United States military puts out a lot of online resources for training, sometimes more formal mentorship programs as well. And then there's folks out there like me who uh, do more informal uh, mentorship programs as far as far as. Uh, assisting with training and guidance and just answering questions and talking about the culture of the teams and what to expect, uh, assuming the, the individual makes it through the program. But really more so focused on the program itself and uh, the, the training that you can do uh, to mentally and physically prepare. There's so many things out of your control. Like we've talked about earlier, there's so many things out of your control uh, that you'll discover about yourself and those around you uh, when you're tested you know, within, within the crucible, the, the, the fire of the early weeks of, of training where the majority of the class is weeded out. But my recommendation is to do as much online research, read the books. It gives you a really intense and in-depth understanding of the mindset, the types of people that, you know, we want in the Naval Special Warfare community that we need in the Naval Special Warfare community. And the other piece I would say is that, and I was actually interviewing General James Mattis, uh, former Secretary of Defense last week, and I asked him, what would you say to, to the parents of young men and women who are possibly aspiring to join the military? And he said, unequivocally, join the military. <laughs> There's no negative impact that could possibly have in your life. Uh, it's one of the most impactful things uh, for any young person to do, just to learn leadership and discipline, accountability, uh, and obviously trades and skill sets. I mean, it's one of the things that we, the reason that my wife and I are so passionate about giving back to the military. I'm on the executive board of the SEAL Family Foundation. She and I co-chair our annual gala. And we talked about pivoting on the on the battlefield, so to speak. Well, one of the things we've done is we're actually May being a mental health awareness month. And June is actually PTSD awareness month since we're talking about military. Uh, she's actually launching a new uh, a new C yeah. a new CBD brand called Veteran Wellness. The website's veteran-wellness.com. And it's, we're trying to support, and a lot of the proceeds go to various uh, veteran uh, initiatives because we're so passionate about continuing that level of service. And because of the level of suicide we see out there, the level of mental health and challenges and depression, uh, we're trying to provide uh, healthier, <laughs> healthier alternatives than obviously uh, we see out there with alcohol abuse and drug abuse and things like that. So our veteran wellness initiative uh, with CBD products, uh, where a lot of that a lot of the proceeds go to uh, veteran initiatives is uh, a big passion of ours. Uh, it's really her project, uh, not mine so much because I'm running Taking Point, but um, the military is, a, uh, as you know, is a wonderful organization. And uh, I, re I recommend anybody who's seeking that do as much research as you can, read the books, network, uh, to things like join things like this and find someone who can, who's been there, done that and can help you on that journey. Yeah, very good. You know, I any young person, who asks, uh, where should I go in life? Unless you have a definite plan, going into the military, serving for three, four, five, six years, uh, my life would have turned out nowhere near as well as it has if if I hadn't done those uh, that time in the Navy. Yeah, yeah, good for you, um, Brent. Uh, another uh, one of our participants writes. I'm concerned resilience, going back to our first conversation, uh, first question, I'm concerned that resilience is not quite enough for what the world economy is going to throw at us. So, you know, uh, the uncertainty that we've got in the economy today, I, I do agree that grit is necessary, but what else is it going to take to deal with uh, the future? And I think it's, your 10 it's points- a, It's a good question. It actually makes me think about- Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's a good question. It actually makes me think about a conversation I had recently with another uh, SEAL buddy of mine. We went through SEAL training together, and, uh, he, and we were at SEAL Team 5 together, deployed together. He got out, uh, a real underachiever, went to Wharton for his MBA, and then had a passion for getting into the, uh, to the oil and gas business. Well, 
uh, as we know, uh, that has seen some significant troubles over the past decade. And he was CFO of oil and gas, uh, mostly drilling and fracking organiz organization. Uh, they got hit hard in 2015. He had to basically uh, move on from that company. Went out and talked, and we're talking about I'm, the stories associated with how can we, I don't want to overuse the word pivot, but make significant changes uh, sometimes in our lives, in our businesses, our careers, sometimes taking us in a different path. Uh, he didn't leave the energy space, but he went out, wrote a business plan, raised tons of money from a firm out of Dallas, and created an oil and gas services company. So, you know, once removed from the battlefield, but still intimately connected to the uh, cyclical nature of that uh, of that business. And what he said to me, we were texting the other day, and you know, he said that he's, you know, he's he's given 12 years of his life to a, a, a an industry that he's very, very passionate about, and now it's gone again. Uh, the industry is, I won't use the terminology he used, <laughs> but the industry is challenged, we'll just say, uh, right now. And uh, we want to leave the Navy speak for, for their offline, right? And you know, he obviously went through some some details and some nuances of, of the challenges that they're facing and are going to continue to face. He said, but you know what? He's like, my family's healthy. Uh, we're happy. We're vertical. There's a beautiful sunrise coming up over over the hill in Amarillo, Texas, where I am right now. And I will find new opportunities. We will all find new opportunities. Uh, the whole philosophy, you know, when one door closes, another door opens. But my recommendation is, you know, don't wait for that door to open. Be hunting new opportunities uh, as we speak. Uh, it's really about resilience. Really, is about it, it's not the old school, just gut it out, suffer in silence stuff that I think sometimes is the misconception that military folks have. But these days, it's really more so about it's about self awareness. It's about seeking enlightenment. It's about appreciation for not just the good things in your life, but appreciation for the suffering that you have in your life. Uh, none of us develop emotional intelligence or mental toughness or grit or resilience necessary to navigate all these obstacles without experiencing suffering and leaning into that suffering, leaning into the pain, uh, trying to identify the purpose behind it, uh, ignoring what we can't control and continuing to move forward. Uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes that I use in speaking engagements is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., resilient guy. And he says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. You can't walk and crawl. Keep moving forward. Uh, I think, and that's the basic mindset. Not, not the the macho. I'm going to gut this out and figure things out. But creativity, innovation, leaning on mentors, leaning on peers, leaning on your family uh, to find uh, new opportunities on the horizon that will ultimately appear. But again, they don't just appear out of sitting back and <laughs> waiting for them to fall into our lap. It takes a lot of research, a lot of hard work, a lot of putting yourself out there and a lot of obstacles and possibly even continued failure uh, over the coming months or years. Uh, but again, this too shall pass. Yeah, very good. So, Brent, that kind of brought, brings up a question that I wanted to ask you. The name of the new book is Embrace the Suck. What does that mean? <laughs> you know what it means, but I'll, I'll explain it for the audience. Um, embrace the suck comes from, I think, I think it was originally coined in, in the Marine Corps. I'm the, I am the son of a Marine, so I do have simplified blood flowing through my veins. But the instructors would tell us uh, to embrace the suck a lot in SEAL training, and then you just learn that as an everyday part of your career. Uh, people think that SEAL training is the hard part. It, it, the job gets a lot more challenging when you're actually on a team and you're deploying and you're in combat zones uh, and you're doing real things. Um, so Embrace the Suck really is, is the a mindset of, of resilience. Uh, one of the things we teach in our programs to leaders is the you know, Carol Dweck's uh, fixed versus growth mindset. A fixed mindset obviously is not one that would be willing to embrace the suck. We take everything that comes our way as fact and the obstacles we face are insurmountable and we just have to figure out other things to do as opposed to overcoming those challenges and leaning into them. Whereas a growth mindset, as you know, is the bedrock of resilience, of embracing the suck, leaning into the pain, not running away from it. I mean, there's plenty of you know, behavioral science research that shows the more we try to avoid the pain and suffering in our lives, uh, the worse off we are. <laughs> And that's really the, the basic philosophy of it. The book is, is, is about resilience. I, I enjoyed writing Taking Point because it was about 
uh, and you're an expert in this, of course, organizational transformation, which obviously, obviously plays a big role, uh, or, or human transformation plays a big role in organizational transformation. It, ha it has to because organizations are made up of people. But I wanted to write a book that was more about personal uh, personal transformation uh, and taking, again, some diff some of the different things that I've learned from my time in the SEAL teams and just in entrepreneurship and marriage and family and life and uh, put them in a, a less fluffy, happy type of term self-help book. Uh, this is more of a, a raw, brutally honest um, narrative around how we can really live our own version of an extraordinary life by leaning into pain and suffering and not shying away from it, not focusing so much on happy self-talk and telling ourselves we're, you know, we're blissfully ignorant all day long and things are going to be great, but they know, you know, uh, you know, you can see there the, the forwards written by David Goggins. I'm sure a lot of people, if not everybody watching this, look him up on Instagram, Google him, but he, uh, you know, retired SEAL, uh, elite ultra marathon athlete, uh, his new book, Can't Hurt Me, came out. And, you know, he, he, unlike me, he did have a very challenging life growing up, dealing with racism, childhood obesity, learning disabilities, abusive household, uh, only to have those challenges follow him throughout his life. And he was in the Air Force, then got out and gained a ton of weight and then decided one day he's going to be, <laughs> become a SEAL. <laughs> now, I will say those listening, he takes the, the, the mental toughness mindset to a whole new level. Uh, most of us out there are not going to become David Goggins, but the premise is to push the boundaries of your comfort zone in any capacity every single day. I mean, he says do something that sucks every day, but in its basic form, it means if we're going to grow and develop mentally, spiritually, physically, we have to take every opportunity we can to push the boundaries of our comfort zone. Nothing magical happens inside our comfort zone. Any goal that you've ever achieved in business and life and sports and career and family, didn't come without adversity. It didn't come without some suffering. Uh, and that's basically what the what the book is about. And also kind of thinking about, you know, what does the end look like? And how do I work back from the end to ensure that I can really, really manage that list of regrets I have the, the day I'm on my deathbed and saying goodbye to the world and hopefully going on to, to bigger and better things. Said, I think... Um do something every day that scares you. So that, that kind of fits with that, which we have time for one more question. I think this fits. Um, my friend, uh, uh, I know you know Bob also, Bob, uh, Admiral Bar Bob Harward, um, who stood up the war in Afghanistan. Uh, Bobby at 60 something still gets up every morning, his, uh, his push ups, ladders, his, uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, sit ups. Um, one of our audience says, uh, what are some effective habits that you and your peers developed over the years? A good morning routine, workouts, uh, uh, learning, that sort of thing. So what's a good way to start the day, Brent? I think that it's a good question because with the, uh, the rapid pace we all live our lives these days and we all have different types of schedules, uh, the, the simple answer is, to, is having a routine, whatever you is uh, and typically and I've actually researched this as well the most whatever term we want to use successful people that the people we think of who've achieved a lot in their lives and, and for, for good purposes and good causes typically have uh, a very similar routine if not the same routine both during the week and on the weekends typically getting up at very similar times every single day going to bed at similar times every single day uh, being disciplined about their wellness habits their dietary habits uh, and also taking time, not just for, for, for work, for family, but also for themselves and also finding time to, uh, to learn something every single day, whether it's in it's for reading, uh, again, going back to the philosophy of being a lifelong learner, uh, and all these things are intimately connected, whether it's physical wellness, spiritual wellness, emotional wellness, and also just, you know, intellectual wellness, all those four pillars combined. Uh, require a routine uh, because of all the distractions we have in our lives. So uh, I always recommend, you know, getting up at the same time every day, finding what the best time for fitness is for you at least five to six days a week. doesn't have to be anything monumental. We're not David Goggins running 500 miles a week. It's if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or starting somewhere if you don't have a wellness routine. Uh, and the other part is finding time during the day for, for, for reading, 
for learning, maybe even something outside of, uh, you know, your, your business practices or what it is. So you have opportunity for spiritual and emotional development uh, as well. I found that a lot of the people I really admire as leaders out there, they're avid readers uh, and they make time for it. Uh, so wellness, reading, uh, time for uh, spirituality, whatever that, you know, whatever that means to the individual, uh, but it has to fit within a routine and that routine needs to be relatively consistent. And I find that people, you know, we, we talk about how, you know, discipline and accountability, this is part of the book, uh, leads to a happier, more fulfilling life. Uh, and discipline is what really unlocks our ability to accomplish more of our goals, to do more of the things we need to do every day, fitness, <laughs> reading, the work we need to get done, the time we need to spend with our spouse or our kids or our family, that does require discipline and consistency and personal accountability. Without those, uh, we get distracted. We're off chasing shiny objects or we are getting sucked into temptation and things that will make us stray from the goals we're trying to achieve or making decisions based on, you know, outside of the values that we hold dear. Very great. Well, thank you, Brent Gleason, author of the book, Taking Point, CEO of the management consulting firm, Taking Point. Thanks to all of you at uh, home for tuning in. As a reminder, if, if you found today's uh, webinar valuable on, on Thursday, uh, two days from now, the 21st of May at two o'clock Eastern time, come in and join us for a conversation with former Citibank CEO and president of Elevate, Sally Crocktow, uh, Crocktow, sorry, and uh, thank you all and uh, be well.